Hi, this is Fred Corey, and you are listening to Appetite for Distortion. You know what I mean? is Appetite for Distortion. And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 251. Thanks for joining me. Uh, you just heard the theme song, of course, by Mike Squires from Duff McKagan's Loaded. And I think our guest today, Fred Corey, deserves his own theme song. Right? <laughs> so that, unless you're, um, I'm an Islanders fan. Sorry. I mean, I like the Kings. So you're, that's the goal song created by Fred Corey. I mean, what an introduction. Wow. <laughs> so Fred, Fred Corey, um, I mean, of course, many of the people who tuned into this podcast know you from Cinderella, the, the very brief stint in Guns N' Roses, which we'll talk to, but there's a lot of things. It's just fascinating how your career has continued to evolve with working with the LA Kings, uh, working just with sports and winning awards for TV shows that you work on. So it's hard to know where to get started with you, but I guess I want to get started by something that you just told me off the air, <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, that you normally don't do interviews. And I get that a lot. And you know what, Fred, even for someone who talks kind of as a living, when people ask me to do interviews, I'm, even I am like, I don't know. It's, do I want to talk about the same stuff? Do I want to, you know, it, even for someone who's lowly as me, I get tired of talking. So for you, and when you, you told me that you're, and you can tell me if I, if I'm talking at a school here, uh, that your assistant's like, eh, do you want to do this? You know, cause I get, cause you get so many requests and you saw my podcast, what it's about, that it's not just a GNR themed podcast, but all these kind of creative guests. And you did me the favor of doing, of, of being here today, of, of talking to me. So that means a lot. Well, you did, you did me the favor of, of wanting me on here. It's just, I'm, I'm always, uh terrified to be a boring guest and usually when somebody has a, a podcast especially with the podcast world because you know if there's been somebody in radio for years and years and years they kind of know where to go i've been in i remember doing an interview with the bon jovi guys way back and the guy interviewing it was a radio station we were playing someplace that night so that whole tour was sold out and the, the dj was doing the interview and it was Tom, me, John, and Alec John Such, Bon Jovi's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tico, Bon Jovi's drummer. And the guy went around the room. He was like, you're John Bon Jovi. You're Tom Kiefer. You're Fred Court. Who are you? And T T Tico just got up and walked away, as he should have, because this guy, all he had to do was just look at the back of the record cover. Yeah. Who the drummer, you know, who this guy is. And so... I find, um, and that's the only time that's really happened. And usually a lot of guys will come in and they'll be like, uh, they just didn't do any research or that they, they just want to ask the same question. How'd you get the name Cinderella? <laughs> it's like, I, and, and it's not because I don't want to answer it. It's the people listening have heard every single story a thousand times. So, and then I find with, with podcasts, a lot of people getting into podcasts, it's their first go at it. Right. So, uh, they're starting at the very beginning and I totally get it. It's just, I don't want to bore the listener to death with the same story. So I just shy away from them, but this, yeah, you have a lot of cool guests and you have, you know, you talk about cool things and, and, uh, it's different, you know, it's, you're a pro obviously. So, and then you try to be, and, well, <laughs> <laughs> so far so good. <laughs> we can ruin that all today. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it could all, it could all end. That's how I, I kind of live. I, I was talking, my last episode was with uh, Linda Perry from uh, four non blondes and a million other things, just like you, the, the resume, just, just Google me. Cause it's just <laughs> the whole podcast would just be reading your both of your resumes, but talking to her, <laughs> as accomplished as she is and, and she still doubts herself. She's still, you know, I could have done this better. I should have done this. So that's kind of how I am. 
So it's it's very validating to hear that from someone who's accomplished as you are. So I know this oh, is a total love thing. fest at the beginning. <laughs> but what I like, <laughs> no, I'm, the, I'm the same way. But what I like to I'm do, because I, I know I'm not um, perfect. I kind of go with the rock and roll approach to it. Like I know, I, I know who I'm interviewing. I know names. But if I'm if I make a mistake, a I want to be um, corrected, and I'll be honest with you. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I screwed that up. And it's not like not a, like a, a, a like a disrespect. Like who are you? You know, um, kind of thing. Right. Like, you know, you're not John yeah. Bon Jovi. You know, who are you? That's just insulting. That, it was so, it was so insulting. Yeah, I mean, you could just see he was so hurt. He was so happy, and he is. No, you know, he doesn't do the interviews, and he was just so hurt. And I, I mean, what thirty years ago, and it still sticks with me how oh. hurt he was by that, and how you know. So anyway, but yeah, the real thing is, I listen back to these things, and I just go. Oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. So <laughs> so you and me both, but but, pe- me. I know, but people listen. People seem to like uh, you know. If, if people weren't listening and and, and these uh, interviews weren't picked up by by outlets, I'd be like, maybe I am an idiot. But I don't yeah, know. No. <laughs> I'm, I guess not. I'm going to prove that to the listeners that uh, I am right about you, that. You're not though, oh, because man. if any, if anything, you taught me a new phrase, which is sonic branding. I had no idea that you do sonic branding for the LA Kings, for the Portland mm-hmm. Trail Blazers. So what goes into sonic branding? So sonic branding, um, I started with that. I didn't start out to be, you know, to do sonic branding. I I was a Kings fan. I was a, First of all, I was a Rangers fan. Sorry, Islanders fan. Uh, but I was a Rangers fan. You started off so well. Was, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> since I was a kid. Um, and you know, I'm a New Yorker, so, yeah. um, uh, I loved the Rangers. And then when I got to Los Angeles, I started going, uh, to Kings games and I got to watch Gretzky play a thousand times, which was amazing. Big. Every time I'd go to a hockey arena and everybody'd be playing the same song and it was always the same thing. And I, I thought, I'm just going to write a song for these guys and it'll be heavy and it'll be hockey kind of centric and I know at the end of the song uh, sounds like glass breaking so it, I kind of pictured in my mind what it's like at a hockey game I did a, a short piece and I sent it in and then six months later I didn't hear anything and I sent it in again hmm. like I tried to find somebody at the Kings I did that for three years Wow! until uh, yeah I just did I disagreed with their non-communication <laughs> and I was like <laughs> And I kept sending the same piece in. And then finally, uh, and I had known Luke Robitaille before because yeah. uh, while I was going and seeing these, if you look on any Cinderella record, he's thanked. On the first record, I think it's Marty McSorley, Kelly Rudy, uh, Luke Robitaille. I had no the idea. The King. Oh, yeah, they used to come to the studio and hang out with us. I had no especially idea. Especially in Arcade. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, so I had known him for a long time and I owned a bus company. and His wife was a, artist and he he leased some buses from me we've we always kept in touch and then when he find out found out that that piece of music was me he said bring him in i want to i want to talk to me we'd lost touch touch for a little while and he uh he said listen i i can see the team coming with their logo on their jerseys i want to hear the team coming i want to know it's them for the before the you know before they get on the ice and that really set everything in motion. And he gave me my first three-year contract with the Kings. And I think this year I'm going into my 13th year. Wow. Close to 13th year. So he really started off the whole thing. So Sonic Branding is he wanted a theme for the team, a recognizable theme, some sort of mnemonic, which is like uh, when you turn on Netflix and you hear that, uh, that's a mnemonic. Okay. And, uh, or dun dun dun, which is the copper top battery. Hmm. Or da 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 da, is McDonald's. Right. You, know what, you know what those are. So, yeah. um, so he really started that off and he wanted a theme. And so they have a couple of themes now. They have a, a, a sonic mnemonic, which is these drums that are the king's drums that you always, you know, you can look on that stuff on YouTube and it's and that is the huge Tycho drums and that's these guys going to war and then there's an, there's also a theme and um, 
that's what I do for, for that team. And, and then I do, there's a show called black and white that, that, um, I do to picture. And it's kind of, it's like, um, 24 seven or any of those HBO shows, same kind of thing. Okay. Backstage look at the Kings and stats and whatnot. Oh, gotcha. Just tell stories. I gotcha. Just storytelling. So I do those. And then same thing with the trailblazers. I do a lot more with the trailblazers because they have a lot more, uh, content that they they crank out sure uh, yeah the, the opens in the arena i'll do the opens and everything is the picture because that's what i do so it's all storytelling uh mostly with picture but trying to tell the story without picture as well and that's sonic branding i'm doing it i just did uh some, probably today i'll finalize uh, a deal with a company that delivers uh it's in the more of the sports world. Um, you'll see a lot of race car drivers and a lot of NFL players and, you know, just athletes and, uh, this really nutritious keto gluten free vegan, uh, delivery service to your door, um, uh, of food. And so they want me to do something for them. So I'll be doing that. And it's cool. It's like kind of like a, the Red Bull extreme sports okay. kind of vibe. So that's Sonic branding in a nutshell just giving them sonic logos and that people can recognize without seeing what it is. They'll know right away. Wow. That takes a really creative mind. And, and for you, I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, not because we were talking about like all the stories you've told over and over again. And we, and you've talked about like how you came up through music and how hard that could be, but it's all about how you stick with it. But here you are, you're already at like an established, you know, musician in the scene. And you are just like, I'm just a fan of the Kings. You know, and you just for over three years, you're like, no, you don't even answer me. Fuck this. You know, it's yeah. so, <laughs> it's so it's, yeah. you didn't have to do that. You could have been like, I can send it in once, but I can only, I can picture you sitting there watching the Kings game and just every time they score your, your mixed emotions. Right. Cause you're like, I, yeah, they scored. I'm a fan, but the music sucks. Oh, so was that, was it like that for three years or, or am I well, just, am I uh, going no, off on a crazy just, story? First of all, no, I'm just, I'm a spoiled brat. I'm an only child, so I don't okay. like to hear no. Okay. So <laughs> okay. if there's a will, there's a way. And, and you know, just keep knocking at the door because eventually somebody's either going to open it and scream at you, you're going to get in. Um, and that was the thing. And, you know, they had Randy Newman, I Love L.A. So that part, I love the gold song that they had back then. They just stopped using it and they started okay. using uh, Rock and Roll Part 2. But that guy allegedly is a pedophile. So yeah, very uh, glitter. Luke, yeah. And Luke was like, I don't want that in my arena. You have to replace the gold song, which is the most daunting gig I've ever had because this is 30 years of a gold song or 20 years or whatever that these fans know. It's a big deal for every fans. fan. Yeah. Every fan. And then to change it. So the first time I played, you know, I asked him, I said, what do you like? Uh, what, what do you like when you walk on the ice? what is the piece of music? And he goes, well, I, you know, what makes my hair stand up is this song and this song. And that's great. So I kind of did my own version of that. And the first time he played it, the crowd, nothing, no reaction. And I was like, Oh my oh. gosh, this is horrible. And he said, no, it's, we got to stick with it. We're going to keep playing it. They will finally get to learn that this is our song. And, um, you know, seeing, 18,000 people chanting those words. I'm, I'm not a lyricist, obviously. It's hey, one word. Right. But uh, to you see them do that at when we won the Stanley Cup, mm. I, I would be lying if I didn't say there were wet things rolling down my face. It was That was like, that was a, a real highlight. It's like, holy cow. You know, they really gravitated towards, towards that piece and, and that's their goal song now. So, yeah, it's just being a spoiled brat. That's too, how I got it. Too cool. Sorry, in my, my listeners <laughs> of my show, sometimes if there's an, an opportunity to talk hockey, I will take it. <laughs> I just, I just fantastic. Because uh, yeah. the, the last time the Islanders won the cup, I was born. So I mean, they're they won last night. Wow. They're they're I know it, it is what it is. Um, they're they're better now. I, you know what? Now I'm getting depressed. Let's focus on other things. Um, so <laughs> I guess with everything that you do for the Sonics, uh, excuse me, the Sonics, the, tra the Trailblazers. And uh, the Kings, is that what we can, like, I guess clients can get 
and on double a double forte music.com, which is kind of what your, your business is. No, I really, I don't have any music on there. I have a couple of things. I think I have a, a King's Christmas thing that somebody posted on YouTube and I put it up there and there might be the gold song on there or something, but I, I, don't have music on my site. And the reason being is because in television and film, when somebody wants something for comedy and let's say it's a comedy show and they go on there and they hear dramatic music or they hear something I've done for a movie or one of the shows, which the first show was a medical drama. The one I just did was like more of a cop drama with comedy, really funny cop drama. Um, and they don't hear exactly what they're looking for. They move on. And if they ask, Hey, can I get a piece of music that sounds like this? Um, then I can send it to them directly and kind of curate what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's just, it's so hard because there's so much stuff. And if they listen to the first three pieces and they're just bombastic and epic or they're more rock based or they're more hockey, because my hockey sound is completely different uh, than my basketball sound. Oh, so, sure. No, I was asking uh, if, um, yeah. what double forte music.com, I guess, like what your, your business provides if people want to reach out to you, you know, to get those things done. For oh them. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they can't hear anything on there. They can, they can contact, uh, us through it, but um, yeah, Double Forte Music is just there to kind of show what we kind of do. Okay, kind of done. Kind of, hey, look at this, look at that. It's it's just a, something to to keep it out there and and just so people can go and look. IMDb is where you know the film and TV world will look, and and most people it's just word of mouth anyway. Sure, and yeah. just which is great. That's the best way because all the great gigs come through your friends, every single one of them. Like this, this food thing, um, it's through a friend, the Kings through a friend through Luke. Uh, my first TV show, which the, the NBC one came through a friend that I met at the Kings that I was on the advisory board with, and, you know, um, so everything comes to your friends. It's good to have anyway. friends. It's good to have friends. Yeah, it really, <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I also want to uh, push people towards your website because it, it's really well done, you know, kind of with your timeline and uh, the pictures and stuff. And I see you with, <laughs> uh, with Wayne Gretzky. And of course, here's where we can pivot. There's you with Guns N' Roses in, uh, in uh -huh. 1987. So I know this is a story that you've you've told many times, but is there any part of the story that perhaps you haven't or in, 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 in now in 2021, like, do you look back on 1987 differently uh, with that time filling in for Steven Adler? Cause he had what broke his hand at that time. And that's when you filled in for, he, he broke his hand. Yeah. It's just funny. That's the, a question that I really don't get asked that much. It's usually all Cinderella based and really. Okay. Oh yeah. So interesting. Uh, I don't, yeah, that, yeah. Um, all right, then I'm asking. <laughs> I love, I love, yeah, I loved it. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, it was. I was out that night, probably seeing a band, and uh, I was staying in New York, um, and I was actually visiting my mom for a few weeks, and uh, a couple of weeks, and there was an. I got an answer. You know, they're answering machines at the time, and I got a message from Doug Goldstein. Okay. Hey learn the song <clears throat> on your outgoing message. I'll call you back in an, in two hours. And, uh, it was in the middle of the night. I probably got home at two. Hmm. So, um, yeah, because I got, a, got another call at four and I had the DNR, the, the record hadn't come out or it was just coming out. And I had appetite for destruction six months before it came out. Uh, our manager gave it to, to us and we were doing a, Japanese tour and that's what I was listening to before going on stage every night this record that nobody knew mm. and it was just it was incredible so four o'clock in the morning I get uh, another call hey Doug and I'd known Doug because he used to be security for David Lee Roth on yeah. the first tour another he's a, friend he's a big friend you know? uh, he's a big friend of the show and yeah he's uh he's great yeah he's amazing so another friend gets a gig right so uh 
he got in with Guns N' Roses and called me and said, can you be on a plane at in three hours to Minneapolis? There's a show tonight. And I said, yeah. He goes, do you know the songs? I said, yeah, perfectly. He said, you do? I said, yeah. Uh, so I got on a plane and I flew out there and uh, they were supposed to meet me at the hotel and rehearse just in a room. We were just going to kind of go through the songs. There was a snowstorm and they couldn't get to the first gig until basically showtime. And uh, so no rehearsal. And um, other than, you know, there was a little issue with getting Axel to the arena on the first night. And uh, I said, well, I'm not going to go on stage without him. And they were like, well, Slash is going to sing this. And this, this you know. Do we have a Slash thing? It was a bass, like a bass player walk. I mean, a bass tech or somebody walked up to me and said, "What song can you sing?" I said, "He talks to me." Actually, he's not coming to the show. I said, "No, I don't. I don't do that. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna go. I'm not playing if Axel's not playing. I'm not gonna start on that." But so all of the nuttiness was not after they got successful. It was always like that. They were always on the edge, and you, that was the beauty of Guns N' Roses. You didn't mm-hmm. know if they were gonna fall off the edge or if they were going to keep it going. And that was the danger. That was the danger that that record brought. They never had that that danger again. They had amazing songs after that, and it's still a great band. But the dangerousness of, of Appetite, they lived it. It wasn't put on. That's why it was so successful. That was them. Axel was like, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not going to the show. And um, he ended up, I met him as he was walking up the stairs to get on stage literally the stairs to the stage and they say, hey nice to meet you let's do this <laughs> and we played a show and it was perfect and wow and that was it and then fast forward to waiting in front of jail to bail him out that night i got to meet i got to get to know the rest of the guys on the tour bus <laughs> while they were <laughs> negotiating his release <laughs> oh j- just Wow, because there's, there's a lot of things to pick apart there. You being a part of uh, <laughs> you being a part of Cinderella at that time and, and Guns N' Roses. I mean, a, the a lot of people just talk about how they change things, you know, in the hair metal scene. I guess how did you view them? Did you look at your own band and be like, what are you know? Did you start looking like introspectively, like why don't we do it like that? Maybe, maybe less. Uh, Aquanet or it, were they were just another one of the crew? I guess, how did you as a peer like look at Guns N' Roses and their sound? They always had that look. So they always had the teased up hair and all of that. It wasn't until later that they calmed that down. They were still wearing jeans, but, you know, and not getting too elaborately dressed. But Axel was, he was an 80s guy. His hair was teased and, and you know, Duff had makeup and and, uh, you know, as street as they were, they were still entertainers. Um, so back then, they were just a little more dressed, just a little darker. Okay. Um, and that, so, no, we just loved the sound. We loved everything, very supportive of them. It wasn't anything like we wish we had done that. It was a completely different vibe. Okay. Um, and they were, you know, they were just, they just had something. I don't think anybody should have tried to copy. I don't, you know, when a band comes out, we came out and then, uh, Brittany Fox came out and they sounded like us. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's kind of diet Cinderella, but it had two of the guys from Cinderella in it. So that was okay. And Johnny D one of my dearest friends, he was in the band and the singer sounded like Tom. And, when a band comes out, there's usually 10 bands that sound kind of like it that come out afterwards. Still to this day. Nobody tried to. Yeah. What's that? Still to this day. Huh? It's unfortunately a, a form. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you know, the cream always rises to the, to the top. Right. But with Guns N' Roses, I don't think anybody tried it. They just couldn't. They, they, it, it just came from inside. It wasn't something like you could sit and write one of those songs. It just came from, from their guts. And, um, that was the beauty and the greatness of that band. And I remember on the road with them, MTV wasn't playing them. Wouldn't play their, wouldn't play uh, Welcome to the Jungle. Right. 
they would not play that song. And they couldn't get any traction until Sweet Child came out. And then it was undeniable that everybody wanted this band. And kind of MTV ate their words and kind of backpedaled a little bit. And, oh, no, we love you guys. <laughs> and started playing them after that. But, yeah, that, that band was still it. Yeah, just something special. And completely it was completely different. It was cool that you said you were listening to the album before it came out, like this Japanese version, right? Uh, it wasn't a Japanese oh, version. I just had a copy of it, and then we were in Japan. Oh, I, so we were on our way to Japan when he gave it. Okay, my, so, my, my brain yeah. combined uh, two of those things. Okay, so <laughs> when you were practicing uh, Stephen's parts, um, I guess, did they come easy for you to, I, I guess, did you bring in... Did you want him kind of mimic Steven's style? Did you go into it with your own style and just learn the, learn the songs? Um, what songs did you find the most challenging? I, I guess if you can just talk about learning the record a little bit and things that kind of still stick out to you. Because of my violin training. Oh, okay. Extensive, 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 extensive. When I learn something, I can, well, I chart it out, first of all. So I get it exactly um, perfect try to do every single inflection the exact same way. And the reason that it, I did that with, with Guns N' Roses, I did it with Poison when I filled in for Ricky. I did it for Night Ranger recently. Um, for, to me, if you change a drum part or you give it your own flair, it's like changing a lyric. Mm. And it's not allowed. In my book, you're not allowed to change it. If you go... I'm say if I hear a like if I wanted to go see the band Boston, I know every single guitar solo how it goes, or ACDC, you know how it goes, or any of these bands, you know what you want to hear, and when they go and take liberties, if it's the band, that's one thing, but if somebody's filling in and changes something, it's like no, you give the the fans what they want to hear, and they want to hear what they know um. So to me, changing a part or giving it my own feel um, is not not cool. Right on. Uh, yeah, it's just not cool. You have to play it exactly like the drummer because that's 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 the deepest respect. Try to learn it like them. Ricky Rocket was really hard because people think, oh, Ricky, you know, he's just playing the songs and and this and that. That guy, when you start listening to it and tearing that stuff apart and start charting what he does, he has a swing, like a Bunny Carlos swing, where you don't hear it on the record. You can feel it, and it's a feel thing. It's like, give me something to believe in. You think it's like this straight-ahead rock thing. He is shuffling and swinging so much back there that it's really difficult to kind of nail that much more so than, than something that's just straight ahead. All right. So, yeah, yeah, I don't like to change lyrics. But then what did you find perhaps the most challenging on Appetite to learn? In such a short amount of time, no less. Um, I don't know. Okay. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. There, nothing was too difficult. Just some weird things. Um, or maybe the perhaps the most fun. Is there one that is that an easier answer? Like the most fun to learn? What was the most fun song for you to play? No, they're all the same. They're okay. all just like I was just. No, there wasn't anything really difficult. The only thing that was difficult was when Axel turned around live and said, "This is a song you don't know." <laughs> um, just follow me. And he turns around and the guitar starts and he starts whistling into the mic. But when you whistle into a mic, you don't hear, you hear, because it's all wind. And I looked at Duff and I was like, what the frig is this? He goes, just follow me. It was patience. Okay. Um, so uh, we did that one and then we did uh, Move to the City, which I hadn't ever heard. Now all I knew were the, were the songs on that, that record. So, um, Wow. Follow me. And it was crazy. You were good under pressure, that, Fred. I mean, just wow. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. It was, uh, that was really, really cool. Um, 
just to see how they do it. And they don't have a set list. It's not like, you know, Cinderella, you go out and see a show. From the first show to the last show, you're going to see the same set list. That's just the way we do it because we build it. We have a certain, you know, the lights are all done. Everybody learns their part for the whole show to build, to build and then bring the crowd down and bring them back up throughout and then finish with a, with a bang. G and R, they were like, I think the Stones are like that too. But they didn't learn it from the Stones because they hadn't toured with them yet. They just, let's see what we feel like playing today. That was it. Man, there's so many fans. I just know, I'm going to speak for the listeners right now. They're like, I wish they did that today. Because, I mean, they've added a lot of older songs now that Slash and Dog yeah. are back in the band, but... You, you know they're going to open with It's So Easy. You know they're going to close with Paradise City. There's there's certain things that don't move now. But I, right. I, I wanted to bring up actually It's So Easy, and I was curious if you were going to mention that because uh, I believe it was in, was it 20, uh, 2002, I believe. Yes, you did a rock tribute to Guns N' Roses. So there was a lot of different artists that contributed to that, and you covered It's So Easy. So like, did you do everything? On that sing- No, I the drummer was Randy Castillo. I got asked to mix to mix it because it, okay, yeah, it I has don't your know name if on I mix- it. Okay, well, no, I sang it. That's me singing it. So it is. Oh, um, oh, okay. So it was Gilby on guitar. I think it's Gilby and Tracy Guns. I don't know who the bass player was. Hmm. Unless I play bass, I don't know. Uh, the drummer was Randy Castillo, and I got these tracks to mix. And they, said, they don't have a singer. Do you want to give it a shot? And I said, sure. So I sang it. So I sang that track. I don't know who played bass. Um, but maybe it was Kyle. Con- I have no idea. But um, that's how that thing came along. And he was just like, do you want to sing it? And I said, yeah. So I sang it. And a, a little known note that Bobby that owns Mates rehearsal in Los Angeles where G and I used to rehearse. I sang on a lot of those demos for Izzy, like Bad Apples, way back when. And so Duff and Izzy would be in there all the time writing. And um, I used to do a good Axel impression. And they asked me, boy, I wish I could find those. But I sang on a lot of those demos when they were just writing them, coming up, hey, will you put a vocal on this? So that was... I forgot about it. I had forgotten about it until we were just talking about, he was talking about that room and how he built something new for GNR and oh, wow. uh, Izzy. And he goes, you remember singing on that stuff? I said, oh my gosh, I do. What did I sing on? He said, bad apples. And that was eight years before it ever came out. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. I have a sound bite. Um, See, I have that ready to go. <laughs> Sorry, that's funny. Um, wow, that's is you gotta find. Like, are they still in existence? Do you think somewhere? I don't know. I have no idea. Are you still- and they were uh, Izzy and Duff had them. I doubt it. Like, who has a cassette collection anymore? I, I have a bunch of things. I and do find like people walk up to me. Hey, here's my CD. I'm like. All right, where do I rent the CD? <laughs> Who gives out CDs anymore? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, thanks, but I can't listen to this. My car does not have a CD player. I don't have one at home, which is, you know, I need to go and get a uh, a DAT machine and a cassette player because I have so many cool things and so many ideas uh, that are probably garbage, but <laughs> could could be good. You know, it'd be nice to go back and listen to that stuff but anyway right so on. i don't know if they had those all right well uh, i'll put it out to the universe that somehow because you always read stories that people find something in their basement or in the wall so who knows there's a there's a dat tape somewhere in in izzy's toilet or somewhere you know in, in the toilet there, there is yeah there's video of me playing with those guys that the crew took throughout the whole tour um crazy i think it's in my friend's attic but i can't get it oh. <laughs> But if I do. All right, let me know. We'll upload it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be a clip. <laughs> um, There's so much stuff out there. It's funny. Right on. I want to ask, I guess, because this was continued, I guess, through your friendship with uh, with Gilby, because a couple years later, uh, 2004, you did the Roots of Guns N' Roses, the Hollywood Rose. Uh, you did a remixing of that, right? And I remember when that came mm-hmm. out. 
Cause to, for mm-hmm. me, that was like, you know, Guns N' Roses was never going to reunite. I was, I, that was like the buckethead days. Uh, so it was, it was a great album. So is there any, uh, special memories of putting that, that album together? No, I was just, that was just something that they handed me and said, okay. Hey, can you make anything out of this? And the track sounded awful. Okay. It was just like literally basement tapes and they were just kind of, can you beef this up a little bit? So I just tried to do whatever I, I could to make them sound a little bit better. I think Gilby mixed some as well on that. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think we both did, but there was nothing that, that other than the fact that songs were pretty much the same way that they went down on appetite. Okay. So the band had it, it, you know, a lot of bands go in there and the producer does a lot to it, but, and Mike Klink is great. He's a great engineer. Um, but I think his whole job was just capture this band. First of all, get them to the studio. If you can get them all in there, that's the biggest task. And then the second part is just capture that lightning because that's all it is. Um, those songs were that way when they wrote them. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty it's, amazing. Yeah. And awesome. I, I know I, cause I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation so much and I want to keep you for, for too long, but there's a couple other things if you don't mind, I want to ask about, uh, sure. or at least get in uh, fan questions cause people were excited to hear from you. Uh, this is, anything. this is, thank you. Uh, I'm here is, now. <laughs> <laughs> this is from uh, Jason Alba. He said he heard rumors that you didn't play on Cinderella's second uh, album, a low, uh, long cold winter that he's credited on the album, but didn't perform on it. Ask if there was a conflict or another scheduled gig that he didn't perform on the album. There were three of us on that record. So I was it on that record three, maybe more. So I did the record. And then Andy Johns wanted to bring in, he said, it's not right. We got to bring in Denny Carmasi. So he brought Denny Carmasi from Heart. And Denny played on the record. And he said, it's not right. And then he brought Cozy Powell in. Now, Denny came in and played his own parts. Then they brought Cozy Powell in. And Cozy learned my parts and played them note for note. And I remember Cozy telling Andy, there's nothing wrong with these. This is perfect. He said, I'm just going to do exactly what he did. And he, and he wrote in Modern Drummer, he did an interview talking about that. Um, so it's, it's all three of us. Okay. Right um, here and there, what songs. So anything that Cozy did with my part, and then there's me, and then there's Denny Carmasi uh, on that. So, yeah. Okay. All three of us are on that. Cool. There you go. I don't. I wish I had the sound bite of uh, "The More You Know." That would have been appropriate, but I I don't have yeah. that pre-programmed. Yeah. Um. And this is something that obviously you get asked all the time, but it's from a listener. Uh. This is from uh, Mish XS on uh, on Twitter. And believe it or not, when I had Tom Kiefer on the podcast, I did not ask him one single Cinderella question because uh-huh. I don't know he seemed <laughs> not, not to be into it. He was, even though he was really really nice. Uh. But he asks, or she, or whatever, Mish asks. Uh, any chance of a Cinderella reunion? And I guess, well, the tour depends on the world, but I, I guess a reunion, if there's any chance. I don't think so. Okay. I don't, we're all so busy doing what we do, and we've kind of moved on from that. And it's like, if we can't do it the way we wanted to do it, like we always put on a big show. I, I'm, I'm not into playing clubs. I like to do it with my friends. Like I'm in Phoenix now. We have a place out here. So we came out um, for just a week to get out of LA. And um, like there's a journey cover band here. And I really love them. They're Mm -hmm. really great. There's another one called escape somewhere in the country. I don't know where they are. It's so freaking good. And like, I would go out and do a handful of shows with those guys. (laughs) That's because and clubs that I would love to do that. It would be such a blast to play those type of things. That's how I would play a club. But in my band, I didn't like wake up one day and say, Oh, I want to be, you know, a rock and roll star. And I want to play clubs. I never did that. I always said, I got to play. I want to be in an arena band. And that's what I did. And if we're not going to do arenas, um, I'm just not into it. Right on. Not with my band. You know, I want to do stadiums next. And that won't be with Cinderella. There's no way. Understood. So, Unless like, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud right now. Like 
I was hoping the the Poison Motley Crew Def Leppard Drone Jet thing was going to kick off something great. Like each summer, they would get other bands from that era to join. I don't mm-hmm. know. So I, I don't if something like that were to happen, you know, I guess if the, the situation was right. Um, but I, no, I'm not going to probe much more for for that. But so I I, I got you, I got you. Um, my buddy John Five always says that you have to put the band together because you know the three of us. He, me, and Nikki are, you know, we're on, we, just, we talk every day. So he's like, you have to put the band back together and go out and do that. And just have Nikki take you. <clears throat> and I don't want to. Okay. It's, we just, we, we just don't want to. It's, it was, the, the memories of the shows were really good for everybody. We just want, don't want to go out there as old guys that suck. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not gonna, not about to. I got gotcha, you. I understand. Uh, and this one, I guess, is I didn't even pick this up. So I'll credit to uh, Good Times Dad on Twitter. Ask him if it bugs him that he was referred to as Fred Curry in Slash's autobiography. T U R R Y. Yeah. It's just a spicy dish. <laughs> um, <laughs> So well, maybe he was every, calling you, you a know, spicy dish. Maybe he thinks you're a spicy sexy. dish. Yeah. Everybody calls me curry. Everybody. Uh, Bobby Blotcher would always call me chicken curry. <laughs> uh, Alan Niven used to call me uh, chicken curry. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, th- I think Stephen Adler still calls me curry. <laughs> so, you know, maybe at least th- people knew who I was that, I played, when I did the Ozzy thing, they thanked me on the ultimate sin, and it was C O U R Y, the correct spelling. And Jake was like, "Hey, man, they were going to spell. At least you can thank me for. They were going to spell your name wrong, and I changed it, and he changed it to C O R Y. So, uh, thanks, Jake. My, that was my first special thanks on a record ever, <laughs> and he spelled it wrong. So, no, I don't mind if they call me Curry. Okay, no, I love that. No, because it's courier c-o-u-r-i-e-r is a courier sure a tennis court is a court c-o-u-r-t so it's i have a problem with the english language so, because they can't get it straight am i mispronouncing it so it's fred uh, did i say it right then fred Corey, not curry Corey. yeah, fred, yeah it's Corey. Okay. okay there you go i could be wrong though <laughs> <laughs> i may be wrong it might be curry uh, I got you all. Well, we know who you are. We know who you are. Uh, actually, one last thing. I'm sorry before you get out of here because you mentioned Ozzy. Uh, do you have a funny Ozzy story, you know, to share? Because, I mean, the dude's a legend. I mean, that's got obviously a highlight for so early on in your career to to work with him. So uh, anything you want to say about, about Ozzy? He was really funny um, every time. Every day, it was just a laugh fest with him. I don't know what and very witty uh, and great. You know, when he would start singing, just a pro. Just nailed it every time. But um, nothing really out of the ordinary uh, with him. He, he was just funny every single day. I really can't pinpoint what it was, but it was, uh, yeah. Okay. That, that was really interesting, living at his house and... <sighs> Uh, that yeah, it's just amazing. Just a whole another level of of greatness, and just really kind, and likes all kinds of music. Um, listens to all kinds of music. Uh, uh, it's just yeah, really, really amazing people. Yeah, right on. See, that's why I knew even before the Osbournes hit the TV. Uh, I saw the old man. It hit the TV. I just knew it was going to be <laughs> funny because that was this personality I got as a fan. And then the rest of the world kind of learned about how Ozzy was, you know, if you, weren't, oh, if, yeah. you, if you weren't a rock fan, I'm like, yeah, this dude's hilarious. In addition to being a great musician and singer. Um, oh yeah. But anyway. I mean, I, I would imagine he would keep, he keeps his band laughing constantly. Sure. Oh, whether it's constantly. on purpose or not. So, <laughs> yeah. Just so, so, so funny. Like I watched that Jack and, and Ozzy's road trip or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, it's so great. And he is a his, history buff. He always has been. So that's, 
And he's also what a great idea for a show. And, and he's also another great idea, especially during the pandemic. It's um, it's what is it? The Osborne's Guide to the Supernatural, or something like that. And it, it's it's uh, uh, Ozzy, Sharon, and uh, Jack just sitting in their den watching all these viral videos of like UFOs or strange happenings and getting their opinion on it and just watching Ozzy react to, Oh, that's bloody that fake. A, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Is it a show? Yeah, it's a, it's a show. Yeah. So if you haven't watched it, yeah. I got to find it. Oh, it's, it's yeah. fun. It's, it's on uh, probably the same one. The, um, the travel one was on, but no, they had like okay. new episodes. It's, it's obvious because they're just at home, you know, they're not traveling anywhere. So it's obviously it has been made uh post pandemic or, Currently. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll watch that. You yeah. got it. Well, it'll be fun. Fred, Corey, thank you so much for your time. This was really an honor, a, pl- a pleasure to, to speak with you. Uh, oh, pa- pleasure's on mine. Thank you. Part of me wishes I was a Kings fan, but that's not going to happen. Uh, I do own <laughs> a Kings hat, and I did when I, I, I have a big hockey jersey collection. I bought the the third jersey for the Kings, and I wore that religiously. You know, this is how I'll end. I wore that religiously when the Kings played the, the Rangers in the Stanley Cup because obviously as an Islander fan, I was rooting <laughs> for course. the Kings. So were you conflicted? You were. Yeah, so were you conflicted? Let me ask that. That's the last question. Were you conflicted? Who are you rooting for, the Kings or the Rangers? Oh, yeah. Well, I have to go with the Kings. Okay, good. So, But I was a little bit conflicted. Now, I did do a drum set on tour that was a Kings and, and I knew before we went out, I wanted to, to donate this kit to King's care foundation, which is for underprivileged, um, kids. And, um, so I had a kit made with Los Angeles Kings logos all over it. And the team was going to sign the bass drum head. We we're going to auction it off after the, after the tour. And it was during the playoffs. And we had a show in New Jersey and we were playing New Jersey Kings against New Jersey. And that did not go over well because here's this guy, the Kings drum set in New Jersey playing. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people with, uh, grimaces on their faces. (laughs) Yeah. Whatever. They didn't like that. I would have loved it. I would have, I would have, you know, put my, my horns in the air. Uh, I'm like, I wanted to see what happens with the Kraken. (laughs) <laughs> in Seattle, that's going to be a cool team. Right on. Well, if uh, the, for some whatever reason, if the Islanders and Kings end up in the Stanley Cup Finals, you got to come back on. Okay, uh, yeah, I promise I will do that. <laughs> you're like good. I'm never coming back on because the Islanders are never making <laughs> the Stanley Cup Finals. Well, who knows? Uh, the Kings aren't uh, aren't much better this year. <laughs> I guess uh, it's a weird yeah. it's a weird season. Well, Fred, thanks uh, thanks again. Uh, again, if you want to just check out the timeline of his work and, and just go down the rabbit hole of the internet, what that's what it's for, uh, just doubleforte.music.com and check out all of uh, everything, Fred. Uh, thanks so much and just uh, continued success. Thank you. You as well. I feel like I say this a lot, but what a nice person. Very lucky to, to speak with Fred. You know, I, I mentioned it at the beginning of the interview, and this is something I've heard a lot. I've been told this by guests that they don't often do interviews, but they checked out what I do and they wanted to speak with me. There's nothing more flattering than that because there are so many podcasts out there. And the fact that he chose to speak with this one, the fact that you chose to listen to this one, it's why I keep doing it. And uh, I, I will mention, because if you just follow the, the podcast on your podcast server, uh, there was a little bit of a break between, I think it was like episode 249 and 250, but I encourage you, because we're, I'm certainly still busy working on the podcast and social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So now on YouTube, if you go to our, uh, our channel, I put up the, the best of West Arkeen interviews. So interviews that we have done that have focused on West Arkeen. And they were with members of the Outpatients, uh, Jamie Hunting and uh, Greg Buckwalter, two uh, separate interviews that were uh, very in-depth, very... Uh, forthcoming with the experiences uh, with West and, and his passing and his, his nephew as well, uh, West young nephew, KC. So I figured it would be kind of cool to, you know, put all of those together in kind of like a giant clip show and, and it kind of equals almost four hours. And normally I would like, who's going to watch something for four hours? Cause I threw up a lot of pictures with that. So while you're listening, because I will get from you, 
the listener, I've been getting a lot of pictures of you watching the podcast on TV. So I'm, I figured, you know what, let me make something specifically for you to watch on TV if you want. So I'm going to put together, so that was a compilation. I should use that as, as a, a better phrase than a clip show. So that was a compilation of the best of our West Arkeen interviews. And there will be more compilations in the future. Uh, one I would like to do, and I am going to do, is focusing on mental health. Many of you reach out about that as well. So uh, the interviews uh, I know I'm going to put up there will be with uh, Brian Head Welsh. Uh, we spoke with uh, Rocco Guarino, uh, who was very heavily involved with Velvet Revolver. Um, there was a whole episode we did with Alan Niven about depression. And I think there's another one I, I would kind of want to put together. So look out for that compilation. I'm going to put that together. And this is just another way for you to consume, you know, the podcast. It's a little more more concise. I take out my my bullshit <laughs> before and after the interview and kind of just get straight to the meat of the conversation. So uh, if you haven't yet, please follow and subscribe on YouTube. And don't forget the conversation continues between the podcast, the podcasts every single day. You can check out posts, pictures on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, all that fun stuff. I don't know if I can, I, I can do a TikTok. I don't, I don't get it. I don't know how people are. I, I, I do this in addition to my regular radio job and I have another job and I, I don't know how people can do, you know, content 24 seven and have like a successful like relationships in their lives. <laughs> bless you. See, that's a successful relationship. Me saying God bless you to my fiance who just sneezed. See, I'm in a healthy relationship. <laughs> it's pre-recorded. I could edit this out if it wanted to. Oh, are you going to leave it in there? I'm going to leave it in here. I'm going to leave it in here. Thank you, baby. So, See, that's why I am able to have a, a successful relationship because I don't always focus on, you know, I focus a lot on Guns N' Roses, but it's not, I, mean, I can't do it 24-7. But the, 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 the shows live 24-7 wherever you, uh, you follow. The social media is 24-7. I'm always responding whenever I can. So just thanks to all of you who have been uh, follow me, follow me, uh, following me along on this podcast night train. Uh, who will the next guests be? Uh, I will tell you one, a couple of announcements. You know what? No, 